I will be reading from Acts 18, verse 1 to 28. Please follow with me. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Achilla, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in the city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. While Gallio was a proconsul, a proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing, or a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But these are questions about words, names, and your own law. See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but none of these things mattered to Gallio. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Achilla. He shaved his head at the century because of a vow he had taken. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined, but he said farewell and added, I'll come back to you again, if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. On landing to Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he set out, traveling through one place after another in the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all disciples. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who, comp who was competent, competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he only knew John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him and more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. After he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, fam. Uh, my name is Shiami, and I am part of the preaching team here. Every now and then you would see me standing up here, and then you may be wondering and asking yourselves, what is it that qualifies you to be standing in front of us and talking to us about God? Well, I have an answer for you. I'm not qualified, but I'm available. 
Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> I think before we go any further, let me just pray for us and then we earn into it. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we come and approach your throne of grace this wonderful morning, O oh Father God. And we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity that you have given unto us and the grace to come here, O oh Father God, and listen and hear from your word, O oh Father God. Here I am, O oh Father God, standing. I'm saying, O oh Father God, may I reduce that you may increase, O oh Father God. May you speak through my vocal cords, O oh Father God, what you will have your children hear and learn, O oh Father God. I am but a vessel, O oh Father God. I do not want to speak from my own wisdom or knowledge, O oh Father. I surrender everything into your hands, O oh Father God, for you to take control. I pray, O oh Father God, that may you speak to your children on this wonderful morning, O oh Father God, and have them hear what you want them to hear. And I pray, O oh Father God, that may your spirit, O oh Father God, speak to each and every one of us, O oh Father, that if there are things that I don't even say, but you want your children to know, O oh Father God, I pray that may your spirit, O oh Father God, prompt Ask, oh, Father God, to understand what you want us to understand, to hear what you want us to hear. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So I, I hear yesterday there was a heart and soul gathering where um, a number of, 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 of um, ambassadors here went out to have fun at uh, action, St. Children Action Sport. And I hear there is someone who was speaking ill of me in my absence. <laughs> so I, I know that uh, they say, a guy that likes competing against me and never really wins, I just let him win sometime. Um, his name is Muzi, I know he's in the, uh, in the... Yeah, he was saying that he was waiting for me yesterday and uh, I wasn't there. I will get him next time. <laughs> so I had a breakfast meeting yesterday with a friend of mine. A very <laughs> I, I, took him, I took him to gym one day uh, and we were together in gym for like 45 minutes and then he was crying the whole week thereafter. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, I, had a, I had a breakfast meeting yesterday with a, a close friend of mine. He's originally from Zimbabwe. We met, I think, in 2005 at a His People Encounter camp uh, at uh, Bloemfontein. So he comes from Zim, we met in Bloemfontein, he was studying in KZN at that particular point in time. I was studying in uh, the University of Limpopo at Tefluop campus. We met there the first time, uh, a couple of years later we met again. This time he was in Pretoria, um, he was working this side. He was a friend to my wife as well. We, they went to the same church. And then when I came to Pretoria, we moved to the same uh, church. And we've been tied ever since. So he's from Zim. I'm from Limpopo. We meet in Bloemfontein. And now we both live in Pretoria. And we're still tied. It just goes to show that sometimes when God wants people to be together, from different places and different moments, he will bring them together however, whenever he wants. Right? And just before I, I continue, I think let me, if you see me moving gingerly a bit, uh, yesterday, as I was saying that they were having a heart and soul, I couldn't attend that because I had to do some other things. And then later on, when the wife came back, I had to go to play rugby in Boxback. And if you know Boxback, you know, yeah, Boxback. <laughs> So, so I, I, my wife was saying to me, uh, maybe you shouldn't go play. I, I did not listen, and I, uh, my heart was, was hell bent and going play to play. I went, I played, we won uh, 88-16. I, I got the privilege of scoring two spectacular tries, if I may say. <laughs> right? Yeah. Unfortunately, now I'm out of commission for like almost three months or so. So if you know a very good uh, uh, biokineticist, please highlight your boy. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you guys, okay, let me put, start it this way. I grew up in a family where my parents never really said, I love you, right? But I knew they loved me. But they never really used ways to, to communicate their emotions. And I think most of us might relate. 
that you've got somebody who loves you but doesn't say that they love you, but you know that they love you, right? And sometimes I wonder how would I have, you know, turned up if I was told many often that I was loved by them, by my parents, you know? Are there, are there decisions that maybe I would have made differently simply because I know that I was loved? And I'm not only do I know that I am loved, but I'm also told that I am loved. Right? So I yearned to be told that I, I am loved. When, and when I met my wife, uh, well, my girlfriend, of 18 years in two weeks' time, um, she was not shy to tell me that she loved me. And I think that's the reason why I married her. Anyhow, what I'm saying here is, there is a saying that most uh, introvert Christians love. And it says, preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words. Most of you know about it. It sounds perfect, you know, because it talks about your character being what preaches to the rest of the people. Right? It talks about the way in which you handle yourself, the way in which you interact with other people, that your character needs to be the one that says, I belong to God. That is a good principle. Right? Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. But is it biblical? Is it biblical to say that I'm going to preach only use words when necessary? Because when I read my Bible, I find that uh, I am told to go out and preach. I am told to go out and spread the gospel. Right? Last week we learned about, uh, we learned that upon arriving in Athens, Paul looked around and he noticed that the people in Athens were religious. And he noticed this by seeing the number of statues that were around, the number of idols that were around. And he saw that these people are very religious. Now, imagine if Paul used this modem, modem of saying, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Imagine if he looked at all those idols and walked around and said, no, my character will speak of Christ. Would we have the Gospels that we do have? Would we have the, the, the ways and, the, and would we have the power that we are able to see in the Bible? Particularly in the books that Paul, and the, of the letters that Paul wrote. If he only decided to use ways when necessary. In chapter 17, verse 16, we learn that Paul's spirit was provoked um, when he saw that the city was full of idols, he did not keep quiet. He went to the synagogues and he reasoned with the Jews and those that were devout. He went to the marketplace and every day in Athens, uh, whenever he could come across anyone who was willing to listen, he preached the gospel. Now you might be wondering, what am I talking about? Or what are we talking about? Or where are we going this wonderful morning? Well, if you're one of those that prefers to have, um, what do you call, titles for messages, the title for today would be, Be Faithful in All Seasons. Be Faithful in All Seasons. Now we will, uh, in, in verse 32 we heard that some people mocked Paul when he started talking about the resurrection of the dead bodies. And for that he left. He left Athens and went over to Corinth. And this is where we are going on this wonderful morning. Now, there are five points that I think I want us to look at today with regard to Paul's mission. And those five are faithful in tent-making season, faithful in full-time ministry, faithful despite the season of fear and weakness, faithful in goodbyes, and the last one is carry on doing the good job. Now let us move to chapter 18 that uh, was so eloquently read for us this wonderful morning. And I think also before I proceed, also let me just take this point and opportunity to, to thank Josie for hosting us like a champ. 
and, and I thank the worship team as well for leading us into, into worship. And, and thank you also, Antoinette, for, for leading us in Sela. It was wonderful. Now, in chapter 18, we learn that Paul left Athens and headed for Corinth. Now, Corinth was a major city in the Roman Empire. At the time, at an important crossroads of trade and travel. It was a commercial center and two harbors, and had two harbors, and had long been rival for its neighboring Athens. Corinth was a city remarkable in, uh, with, with a remarkable reputation of loose living, and, and especially sexual immorality. In the classical Greek, to act as a Corinthian meant to practice fornication. And a Corinthian companion meant a prostitute. The se- this sexual immorality was permitted under the widely popular worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of fertility and sexuality. So I'm just wondering, I was thinking, if we were to say Corinthian on this day and age, I mean no disrespecting, by the way, but it would be almost like Hillbro or Sunnyside, if you know what I mean. Right? So it is lawless. Everyone does what they do, you know. Everyone does whatever they want to do. But in verse 2, we learn that Paul found a Jew named Aquila and Priscilla, the natives of, uh, well, they were from Italy, but then, let's just show the map here a bit. I just want to show you guys something. So, Priscilla and Aquila comes from there, Pontus. They are the natives of Pontus. They meet Paul here in Corinth. Right? Now, imagine Paul, they meet him in Corinth, but where does Paul come from? Paul comes from somewhere here. Right? See how far apart their worlds were. But God brought them together for a purpose. God brought them together for a purpose. Now the Bible says that in verse 2, after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. He was a tent maker, so they were. There was something that brought Paul and Aquila and, and, and Priscilla together, their profession. They were in the same trade. There is a point of familiarity and commonality that has been created between Paul and Aquila and Priscilla. God gifted Paul with a community where he was. God intervened and provided for Paul through finding people who did what he was doing. And what did Paul do? It says that he worked with them. But every Sabbath, whenever he took a break, he knew his mission. He understood his mission. He worked with them. And I believe that even when he was working with them, he did not stop talking about Christ. I believe that even when he was working with them, he also spoke to them about Christ. He evangelized to them, I believe. Are you at a place where there are people that you're working with that do not know Christ? What actions are you doing to bring Christ to them? What actions are you doing to bring Christ to them? We don't know how he found them, but he did. It was discovered that they were in the same trade. Their work kept them together. We have an opportunity to share the gospel with our fellow co-workers. I understand that we are now living in a place or in an environment where God is being kicked out of many places. Right? Everybody says we need to be politically correct. 
There are too many religions. We do not talk about your God. Right? I, I used to work at a place where every single morning before we started, our leader was a devout Christian. And every single morning before we started, we started the day with a prayer. And we came early excited because we knew that we were going to pray. We were not taking into our employer's time, but we made a concerted effort to be there early and start our day with prayer. When they try to kick God out, God brings you in so that you can bring God in. So whenever you have an opportunity to speak about God, to show the world God, do not say, no, I would only speak if necessary. I would only let them see my character and my work effort and know about God. Speak about God. Take time out during your lunch breaks. Have cell, uh, cell meetings during your lunch break. Talk about God. Have worship at work during your lunch break. Talking about God. Showing God to all who cares to see. Statistically speaking, we spend more time with our colleagues than with our families. Imagine with, working with individuals who, like you, believe and have the same experience, the love of Christ. Yeah. Imagine starting a small group and meeting to discuss the living Christ during your lunchtime, breaking bread as well as you nourish the soul. Paul found like-minded people to do life with. He did not stop there, though. As verse 4 says, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews. When he was not working, he had given himself to the mission of Christ. But for us, most of us, Christ is just put in the back burner. We only talk about him if it's convenient for us. But he is our life. He is our life. He proceeded to be faithful to the great mission in his tent-making season. He was not like some of us who some Sundays we wake up and do not feel like waking, coming to church and we just say, ah, next time. Now, for him, every opportunity that he did not, he was not working, he did not waste it. He used it for the kingdom. He used it to preach the gospel. Do we take the opportunities that we have to interact with people around us and extend the mission? The process of being, tent, of being faithful in a tent-making season starts with, start with accepting that Jesus suffered as a substitute for our salvation. Salvation is repenting, receiving his forgiveness and remembering the good news. It is surrendering to him and knowing that he still will accept us on this very same day. I'm part of a discipleship group, and what we are currently going through, we are looking at whether we as Christians are having the, char the character of Christ in us. Are we saying that I'm a Christian simply because it sounds cool to say that I'm a Christian? acknowledging and associating myself with his name, with the name of Christ, but dissociating myself from his character. If I come across some people who do not know that I'm a Christian and they interact with me, will they be able to see the Christ in me? If I speak to someone who does not look like me, who does not seem to be in the same sophistication as me, will they understand and the words that are coming out of my mouth, will they say, there is something different about that guy. Or are we like the world assimilating to every single thing? Are we associating ourselves with the name only and dissociating ourselves from his character? We are working through having the character of Christ in us. Whether everybody is watching or anyone is watching or not, the character of Christ, that is what we want. And that is what the world so desperately desires at this point in time. To see the character of Christ. To see his children rising up. And showing the world 
how to truly love, how to truly forgive, how to truly embrace the character of Christ. Are we having that? Do we have that? Can the world see the character of Christ in you and I when they look at us? The way that you interact with a car guard, does it show the character of Christ? The way you interact with a cashier at, at, at a shopping complex, does it portray the character of Christ? The way you interact with, with a waiter when you went out to have some meals, do you even know his name? Do you even take time to understand his name or memorize his name so that when you need him, you don't just say, but you call him by name. Because you see him. Because you see him. You see, Christ sees us. And he calls us by name every single day. He takes the moment to know us. He takes time to know us. Because he called us. Can't we just extend the same gratitude? Know the people around us. Call them by name. Make sure that we understand. They make, we, make sure that we, we make them understand that we see them. In, 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 in Isizulu, when they greet you, they say, Saubon, I see you. In, in Sepedi, meaning I'm humbling myself before you. I don't know what hello means. <laughs> right? But, but you see, that is, that, is, that, is, that is the thing. We need to see the people around us. We need them to understand that they are seen then we will be able to show them the Christ. You cannot show me the Christ when you cannot even see me. When you cannot even see me. When we interact with individuals who do not seem to be of our level of sophistication, can people see Christ in us? Fam, let us be faithful in our tent-making season. Let us be faithful in our tent-making season. Let's move to point number two, being faithful in full-time ministry. I understand that most of us are not in full-time ministry, and we're like, no, that doesn't apply to us. But there's a principle here that I want us to, to look at, and, and hopefully will make us understand some, some things. Remember in chapter 17, verse 15, when Paul was... Uh, when Paul, Paul asked uh, those that were with him, to tell Silas and Timothy to join him. He says, but Silas and Timothy stayed behind. And then those who escorted Paul uh, brought him to Athens and then left with the instruction for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. You see, first he went there alone. He became a tent maker because he had to sustain himself as well. But now, he asked for Paul and Silas, I mean for, for, for Silas and Timothy to join him. In chapter 18, verse 5, we see the arrival of uh, Silas and Timothy. Immediately, we see a transition in a manner in which Paul operated. He transited from being a tent maker to being in full-time ministry. Simply because he had people to support him now. He had people to support him. He did, not, he did not need to do any other work for his sustenance, for he had support from Silas and Timothy, and possibly the gift they may have received from whence they came. Things were looking up. He was like, yeah, now they are here. So you stay here, maybe even do the tent making. Let me go into full-time ministry. Let me go and do God's work. And you would think... That because he's going into it, he's like invigorated, right? That everything, things are looking up, he's going to really crush it. He's going to really crush it. And I believe that that is the op optimism that he had as well as he was going into full-time ministry. Unfortunately, oppositions arises. You know, this is like, it's like, um, I've never been pregnant, but my wife has. Okay? It's beautiful when you first find out that you're pregnant. 
and you're going to be bringing new life into this world. And months comes, months go, six months, the cravings maybe have subsided a bit. The morning sicknesses are possibly long gone. And it's just about the baby start kicking. And, and I remember for, for, for our first child, um, she would be lying and then I would be holding the stomach and then I would hear, feel the kicks. Oh, what experiences. Wonderful. But then comes the eighth and the ninth month. Then, Mutabudim, she's tired. <laughs> she's tired all the time. And I believe that she's at a moment where she's like, hey, just come out now. <laughs> huh? I want to be able to sit down and tie my own shoelaces. Right? It is that time, things are looking up, but you're tired all the time. You're tired all the time. But you know also that what is coming out is going to be beautiful. You know also what is coming out is going to be sweet. You know, now I come home from wherever I come from, and then I can just lie down on the couch and forget to take the, the remote from the table just there, and then I'll just call out, hey, come give me the remote. <laughs> That's the beauty of it now. You know, that's the beauty of it now. They say that it is always darkest before dawn. When sharing the word of God, we need to be prepared for opposition. Understanding that opposition does not mean that we should stop sharing. Sometimes opposition means that we should change our standing. When Paul, but when Paul, in verse 6, but when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook off his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Doesn't this look familiar? Shaking off things off of yourself? If you look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, let's hear what, what, what happened. In actual fact, let's just go to Matthew 10, but let's read verse 14. If any of you, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that house or leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet. You have played your part. You see, sometimes we, 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 we make the mistake of saying that if I'm going to preach to someone else, then they must accept what I am saying. And when they don't accept what I am saying, we feel personally attacked. But it's not about us. It's about God. Ours is to play our part. Ours is to play our part. Here Paul shook off, not the dust of his feet, he shook off his garment. Paul did this so that uh, not a speck of dust from the synagogue will remain on his clothes, much less his sandals. This was a dramatic way of showing that he was rejecting their rejection of him. Paul was certainly capable of dramatic and vivid demonstration. <laughs> but he was faithful, nonetheless, in the midst of opposition. Because he did not stop. Paul being rejected. Paul is being rejected, but he had played his part. He was moving on knowing that he had played his part. The fear of rejection, or rejection itself, should never stop us from preaching the word of God. But guess what Paul does after being rejected in the synagogue? He goes next door. You may reject me here, but I know somebody else might not reject me. I may want to speak to you about Christ and you're saying, no, I'm not interested. It's okay. Maybe somebody walking next to you will be interested. Because I'm not going to give up preaching the word of God. I'm not going to give up talking about the love that I have received, the grace that I have received. You see, if you have received something so marvelous, it will, don't you think it will be selfish to want to keep it to yourself? And I'm not talking about, you know, like these, these messages that we see of Forex traders. I've made millions, let me show you how. Because we all know that this. <laughs> but I'm talking about true life here. You are receiving true life from God. Don't you want to carry someone and walk with someone? 
being faithful, even though some people may be rejecting you. Still saying, I may be rejected, but I know it is not about, it's not about me, it's about God. He himself will convict the hearts that he wills to convict. Paul remained faithful and preached the word next door. The Bible says that many believed. Do not be uh, dismayed or dissuaded from sharing the gospel because of opposition. Remain faithful even when you are being opposed. Remain faithful even when you are being opposed. Let us move to verse 9. And the third part, the, four, the third point, being faithful despite the season of fear and weakness. From verse 9 it says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. You see, some of us, we tend to forget that Paul was a human being. Paul had emotions. He had feelings. And his feelings could be hurt too. Imagine going wherever you're going, preaching the word of God, not hating anyone, but being the one that is hurt, being falsely accused, sometimes being stoned, being threatened with death, being put in jail. That must have taken a toll on Paul's mental health. That must have taken a toll on Paul's mental health. But you see, he says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching the gospel of God. Now, reading this makes me understand properly what Paul meant when he, he spoke in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It makes sense because Paul had first, uh, uh, first-hand experience. He saw the empathy of God in his moment of weakness. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, Paul says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You see, despite all the torment that he received, Paul was encouraged by God. You see, there, there is something different about being particularly and specifically encouraged by God. Not by human beings, but by God feeling him and hearing him speak to you. Hearing God speak to you. Not hearing people speaking about what God is saying, but hearing directly from the source. No one will understand how comforting that is. I have shared this story before. A number of years ago, uh, my family and I, we, we, we went through some tragedy and, and we lost our baby. And in the midst of all that, God approached my wife and comforted her. And it was a comfort that I couldn't even explain. When she got out of all the medication that they had given her, the peace she had, I couldn't understand. And that was because she had a personal experience with God in the moment of weakness and tragedy. God comforted her. Granted, I was jealous. Because why her and not me? Right? Why her and not me? And I remember I was coming from watching a, a rugby game and I was still you know, complaining to God saying, but why did you speak to her? I also need to be comforted. I also suffered a loss here. And then I clearly heard God say, imagine if I did not speak to her. Imagine if I did not comfort her. I definitely would have not been able to console her. But you see, when God comforts you, the peace that comes, you get rejuvenated, re-energized, 
And that is what happened to Paul. Hence, he stayed there for a year and six months. It is said that this is the longest that Paul has ever been at one place. Are we having problems with the people around us? Are you having problems with a spouse or partner? And you feel like throwing in the towel because it's a moment of weakness that you might be in, of fear of the unknown. Don't throw in the towel. Are you struggling to find employment? Don't lose heart. The sun shall rise upon you as well. Are you heartbroken? Be still and know that he is God. Are you on the verge of giving up? Keep fighting, for God is with you. Are you in pain from losing loved ones? Just know that you are loved and you are known known by name. The Lord said to Paul, for I am with you. This promise was the basis for God's command not to be afraid and to keep preaching. When we understand what this means and who says it, that is enough. That is enough. When we understand that we are known by the Creator, that is enough. When we understand that our Creator surrounds me, it reminds me of a song, when, the, when it looks like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. When you understand that you are surrounded by God, you get rejuvenated. Are you weary? Are you tired? I know the rejuvenator the rejuvenator of our souls. He can strengthen you, gives you more courage to rise up from the ashes because he is our God, our creator. And he says, I am with you. And he says, I know you by name. Charles Spurgeon, when reflecting on this, he says, he thought, it emphasized three things. The presence of Jesus, which is enough. The sympathy of Jesus, which is enough. And the cooperation of Jesus, which is enough. Imagine you being a Christian. And this is something that we do have. Look at what he says, Charles Spurgeon about being, you know, in the midst of trials and tribulation. An ointment for every wound, a cordial for every faintness, a remedy for every disease. Blessed is he who is skilled in the heavenly pharmacy and knows how to lay hold on the healing virtue of the promises of God. When you have accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior, you've got access to the heavenly pharmacy. Use it. Use it. You've got access to the heavenly farmers. Use it. Also, consider, that the, consider the possibility that today, as the, as the Lord said to Paul, I have many people in this city, that you might be one of those many people that need to bring encouragement to someone else that you might be one of those people, that somebody around you, maybe close to you, is on the verge of giving up and just need to know that, hey, I am one of those that God has sent for you to encourage you, to uplift you. Maybe you need someone to encourage you. Maybe the person sitting next to you might be that particular individual. And maybe you are that particular person. Fam, it doesn't matter what state of weakness and fear you find yourself in. Whatever position you are in, it does not matter what you have done. Jesus' call remains true to this day. If you feel weak and you feel undeserving, 
You feel like the burdens are too much. This is what Jesus says to you today. In Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Just as you are, as dirty as you may feel, as undeserving as you may feel, he's saying to you by name, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Even now, we can accept him as our Lord and Savior. He can repent from our sins, for he is calling us to himself. Come to me, he says. Sometimes you also need to say goodbye. And even in those moments, we can be faithful. In verse 18, we learn that Paul stayed, uh, this uh, point number four, faithful in goodbyes. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at, is it, how do you pronounce this? Kenkria. Kenkria. I was wondering whether it was Kenkria, Centria. <laughs> because of the vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went on to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with him, he declined. There are some times when we are still doing good things, we also need to say, not now. There are times when we are saving, even in the church, when we are saving and we are asked for many other things and you do feel that you don't have capacity, it is okay to say, no, I don't have capacity at the moment. It is not a sin to say, let me take a moment out. It is not. And if you feel overworked in this church, trust you me, I know that the leadership do not want you to feel that way. Take a break. It is okay. Take a break. It is okay. But he left and he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. See, sometimes we need to say goodbye permanently. Sometimes we need to say goodbye, but for a moment. Are there things in your life that you need to say goodbye to? Be it permanently or for a moment or for a season. It is okay to say goodbye. It is okay to say goodbye. Now we also need to understand that this, okay, let me just read and finish here. When he landed in Caesarea, he went to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So this is the end of Paul's second mission and the beginning of a new one. And the beginning of a new one. Uh, maybe let's have a map and see if I can try and point some things out here. So, he lives here with Aquila and Priscilla and they go here. He leaves them there and then he Paul sails back and encourages everyone here and ends up here. Right? He ends up here. He left them there. And when he's here, and you may think that, no, yeah, that's it. But now Paul only goes around encouraging others. And then the mission starts again. But the ones that he left behind do not stop because Paul is gone. The ones that he left behind proceed with the mission. Proceed with the mission. You see, there are different seasons in life, a season to meet and a season to say goodbye. Paul was in tune with God and understood when it was time to say goodbye. 
Is there anything in our lives that we need to say goodbye? So for some of us, it is time to say goodbye to social media for a season. For some of us, social media has stolen that sanctity of being in the presence of God. For some of us, it has stolen the moments and the joy of being together with our loved ones. When we are together, the first thing that we see is an opportunity to take pictures and post them in social media instead of enjoying the moments with our loved ones. Maybe it's you or maybe it's me that we need to say goodbye to Twitter, to WhatsApp, to Instagram or Facebook or whatever social medias are out there. Even the TikTok, Tiki Tokis. <laughs> Fam, let us be faithful in every season. As I was saying that the ones that Paul left behind, they did not stop simply because Paul was not there. They were equipped for the good work. Let's go to point number five and talk about carrying on the good works. And we will read Acts 18, 24 to the end. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man. He was an educated man. With that knowledge of the scripture, he knew about God. He knew the scriptures. He had been instructed in the ways of the Lord. And he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. He taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos went, wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. I don't know if you guys come from churches um, when, 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 when I was growing up, the church that I was in, when I was leaving, uh, having to go to a different place, they will write a letter, a testimonial, to say, this is a good brother. Take care of him. Treat him well. For some of us nowadays, we just leave church like we'll come back but never say anything to anyone. We don't, no one even knows where you are spiritually. Right? Talks about being accountable. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed. He vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Let me show you something also again on the map of how people from different places meet for God and for the purpose of God. Apollos was from here, in Egypt. Paul, Antioch. Aquila and Priscilla, Pontus, they meet in Ephesus. Look at the connection, the web that God creates. In every season, God creates webs for his good work. Are you ready to play in the web that God creates? Are you open to playing in the web that God creates? And also, the one thing that stands out for me here is the fact that Apollos was a learned man. He was an educated man, and he had thorough knowledge of the scriptures, and he taught about Jesus accurately. As educated as he was, he was open and receptive to Priscilla and Aquila when they came to him. He was open and receptive to their schooling. I recently, you know, changed roles at, at work. And uh, there were certain things that I used to do long before 
that we stopped doing when I moved to another place. And now where I am, we need to do that which we used to do. So when, we, when I was speaking to one of my bosses about it, and I was like, no, I know how to do these things. And then she was like, no, we are doing it differently now. And then I had to sit back and say, though I know how we used to do it, but maybe there is something else that we were missing back then. I was open to learning a new way of doing things. I was open to the new hack of doing things seamlessly. I was open to that. Are you open to learning and unlearning and relearning? Are you open to being directed despite the knowledge that you might think you have about Christ? When you speak about Christ, you, in your own view, maybe, and indeed it may be true, that you are speaking accurately, but you can always speak adequately. He was open to speaking adequately. His openness to being discipled transformed him into a mighty warrior. Hence, other individuals who, by grace believed, gained much. Because he was open to speaking adequately. Apollos continued the good work that Paul had started. The multiplication effect. Teach one, reach one. Do we know too much to receive counsel? Are we open to different ways of doing things? And this is not to say that the way that you've been doing things is wrong or bad, but there are different ways of doing things. Every time before I come to here, I have the luxury and the opportunity and the honor and the blessing to sit down with Reino and we talk about what I think and I feel God is saying that we need to learn. And I would have ways that I want to portray it and say it and he would not change a thing, by the way, but just show me a different way of saying the very same thing. Are we open to that? Fem, I'm encouraging us not to be too learned to learn. Not to be too learned to learn. Let us be open to learning anew, seeing too different ways of doing things. That has been open to being discipled. Dear Heavenly Father, here we stand, O oh Father God, this morning. We thank you for your teaching, O oh Father God, that we may be faithful in every season. We pray, O oh Father God, that may you give us the courage when we are weak, O oh Father God, strengthen us. Rejuvenate our souls, O oh Father God, that we may be reinvigorated, O oh Father God, for your work. We come to you, O oh Father God, and we thank you, and we say, Lord of all creation, continue, O oh Father God, doing the good work in us, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Father God, that may you continue, O oh Father God, loving us, caring for us. We come and we humble ourselves before you, O oh Father God, for all this is for you, Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.